Father, we do uh, just lift up this time, God, and I do pray that you would, God, you would speak to us. As we watch and learn, Lord, as this confrontation, this, this uh, uh, whole uh, <clears throat> hostility is just brewing there in Jerusalem against you. And Lord, I do pray that, uh, number one, we would learn how to handle hostility, but greater than that, we would fall more in love with you, understanding you are who you said you were. And God, that it, we should never be ashamed of, of declaring that and owning that. And so I do pray for us tonight that this would be a time where, Lord, we just fall more in love with our God and we leave here tonight, Lord, encouraged and strengthened in our faith and built up and ready, God, to honor you with the things we say and the things we do. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we're looking here at at chapter, uh, uh, chapter seven, I think the big challenge for people in chapter seven is either you're gonna choose Jesus or you're gonna be against him. And that's kind of the way it is in the world. He's gonna, we're gonna watch some are drawn to him by the message that he gives and by that same message, some are repelled against him and pushed away and we need to know that. We need to be people who we don't get so freaked out when people get upset about what we say. The world's the world, and we're not. And we need to understand it. And we need to understand so often when we're speaking to people, and we're gonna see this tonight, when you're speaking to people in the world, they don't process the things the same way we do. We see things through the lens of Jesus, and we're spiritual. They're not. And why do we get so uptight? So I want us to think about that and watch how he handles it and the things he does as he approaches this hostility and as it comes against him. Now, listen, we watched, remember, his brothers hassled him. Hey, why don't you go up to Jerusalem and show everybody you're the Messiah? And he said, hey, that's not my time right now. You guys go. And then he went up later. And then he Uh, He spoke publicly, and he taught, and they questioned, who is this guy that can teach this way? He didn't go to any of our schools, right? And then he talked to him about, why are you so angry with me just because I healed a guy on the Sabbath? So that's kind of where we left off, right? So all of that is building up. Now, in verse 25, it says, now some of them from Jerusalem said, is this not he whom they seek to kill? But look, he speaks boldly, and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? However, we know where this man is from, but when the Christ comes, no one knows where he's from. So a couple things going on. Number one, they're looking around, and they're going, here he is out in the open. Isn't this the guy they wanted to kill? Why are they not, like, why are they not killing him, right? If you want to kill him, get to kill him and get it done and do it. And they're, like, wondering that. And then they make this kind of bold statement. Do these guys really think this is the, the Messiah, right? When they say the Christ, that means the Messiah. So they're, like, wondering. And, hey, the common people are messed up. The religious leaders are angry. And then you got some people kind of wanting to follow Jesus and not sure how to handle all this. So you have this mixture of this crowd. Remember, this is during the time of the Feast of the Tabernacles. And that's a seven-day feast and a very, very happy one. Not kind of one of the downer ones, but a real happy one. So these people are wondering that. And then, listen, they, they, they say, do the rulers think he's the Christ? Then they make this statement that's weird. I think, right? They say, however, we do not know where this man is from, but when the Christ comes, no one knows where he's from. We're gonna read in a little bit, this same crowd contradicts that, and and we'll talk about it. But here's the thing, where did they come up with that? Where did they come up with, no one knows where he's from, where the Messiah comes from? Oh, it was all about tradition, and teachings of the rabbis, not the Bible. Huh, isn't it interesting? And I always think around Christmas time how it's interesting there's so much tradition that kind of floods us that we don't even know as believers that we're accepting something that's tradition and not scripture. 
for instance, three wise men. Where is that in the Bible? Well, Pat, you know there were three. How do I know there were three? It never tells me there were three. Well, there were three gifts, so there had to be three. And we kind of come up with that, right? We come up, we come up with, and that's just one. I hope I didn't ruin your Christmas. <laughs> oh, and one more thing I teach every Christmas. They did not come when he was born. They came about a year later, maybe two years later. So in your nativities, put the wise men on the other side of the room. Because they're not there yet. They're on their way, right? Just separate them out and do those things. But do you, you kind of get my point? Listen, we all fall into that trap, don't we? Of we, we follow that somebody said something, somebody else says it, and then it just kind of becomes part of it, and we kind of fall into it. And that's what happened with these guys. Hey, they go, hey, we don't even know where, you know, we know where he's from, but when the Christ comes, no one knows where he's from. Oh, in Micah chapter 5, here's what it says. But to you, but you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one who is ruler in Israel, whose going forth are from old, from everlasting. So where's he supposed to be from? Bethlehem. Now, here's what's crazy. These guys said that here, and pay attention, don't go to sleep, because you're going to find out they're going to say something totally different in about... 20 minutes. So, listen, so, so kind of stay awake, right? Pay attention. I kind of I sucked you in there. So, they, here's what the people are going, and I, I don't know that all of this was out loud, but this is what's going on, right? Kind of the, the fill of everything. And then verse 28, then Jesus cried out as he taught. So, Jesus is still teaching in the temple, and this says he cried out. Here's what this means. He was shouting, Right? He wasn't keeping it quiet. He kind of cried out. Why? Because they go, we know where he's from, and, you know, you're not supposed to know where the, the, the Messiah is from. So he cried out as he taught in the temple, saying, you both know me, and you know where I, where I am from. Now, I want to stop there for a minute, because you need to know something. He's being sarcastic. Right? He goes, you think you know me, and you think you know where I'm from. Where did they think he was from? Well, again, I read ahead, and I don't want to give away everything that's coming up, but they think he's from Nazareth. Why? Because it's where his family lived, right? So that's their, where they're from, where they think he's from, and the fact that he's in Capernaum. So here's what he's saying. He's being sarcastic here. He goes, you really don't know what you think you know. And I think that's important that, again, we need to be careful. When we think we know something, we need to know something and not think we know it. We need to study it and find out. So here's what he says. You both know me and you know where I'm from. And then he says this. And I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true. And you do not, and him, or whom you do not know, but I know him, for I am from him and he sent me. Oh, man. Listen to what Jesus, Jesus just pushes, right? He just pushes them a little bit further. They're angry because he healed somebody on the Sabbath. They haven't forgot that. By the way, that was about a year ago. But they're still angry about that, right? And they're still miffed about that. Now they're doing the celebration. He shows up. They can't understand why he's teaching the way he's teaching. Now he like pushes it a little bit further. And what did he just tell them? Once again, what's he declaring? I came from God, which means I'm God, right? He kind of let him know that, and he goes, hey, you only think you know me, you know, to be perfectly honest, I'm not even from Bethlehem. I'm from heaven, right? I came direct. So he says, but you don't know him. Now, why would he declare that? Because they don't know his word. Listen carefully. You cannot have a relationship without, with God without knowing his word. You can have a relationship with a God you make up without knowing his word, but you can't have it with him. So Jesus challenges them and says, you don't know him, but I know him because I'm from him. Now, listen, I think Jesus kind of, now he pushed some buttons. He didn't just push the buttons of the leadership. He kind of just pushed, he like, you know, uh, uh, I was going to say a nine-finger death punch, but he kind of did. Some young people get that, but you old people, you'll have no clue. It's okay. 
Look it up. Google it. So, listen, I think he's like, you know, pushing ten fingers at once, pushing buttons. And then, therefore, verse 30, therefore they sought to take him. So kind of get the idea. Here he is in the temple. There's a crowd around. There's people all around. And then he makes a statement, and I think they rushed in to grab him, right? I think they wanted to take him, at least maybe take him prisoner, maybe take him to the leaders. And I think they're rushing in. And it says, listen, they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Remember when we started this last week, we said, you've got to do things according to God's timetable, and he has a timetable. And you know what? Here's what I found. We really can't interrupt his timetable. Oh, we may try, and we may do our best to mess it up, but God's timetable is still God's. So they come to grab him. They can't, and I don't know if people, you know, buffeted one another. I don't know exactly what's happening, but they couldn't get a hold of him. He, you know, a slippery guy, and they couldn't get a hold of him. And then John lets us know because his time had not yet come. Then verse 31, and many people, and many of the people believed in him and said, when the Christ comes, will he do more signs than these which this man has done? And the Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Oh, now it escalated, right? Now it went upstairs, and now the religious people, they're getting directly involved. I think they were indirectly involved, but now they're getting directly involved. And here's what they did. They had the, the temple police, which were probably Levites at the time. And they said, okay, you guys go and you guys arrest that guy. Get him off the streets. He's ruining everything. Isn't it funny how religious people really don't like the Jesus of the Bible? They like a Jesus, but not the one of the Bible. And these guys are saying, we gotta do what we can to get rid of him. And again, it always like, just blows my mind that the people who should know, I especially think of Pharisees, and I bring this up often, because you know, oftentimes we, all we think about Pharisees is that they're hypocrites and et cetera, but man, they knew their word. They knew the word inside and out. And how can you know the word that well and be that messed up? Because you know what? There's no one as blind as those who refuse to see. And they don't want to see. They don't want to hear it. It's messing up what they've got going on. It's not fitting in with their plan. And who is this rebel who's coming out of Galilee teaching the way he teaches? Number one, he kind of stepped on our toes doing that. And number two, he's declaring these things. And then he healed that guy. What are we going to do? And now the people are recognizing this really could be the Christ. This is going to ruin everything for us. So you know what? You guys, and they get these guys together. You guys go arrest him. Now, I think that's kind of comical. Like, why don't you go arrest him? If I was one of the guys, I'd tell them, why don't you go arrest him? I don't want to go arrest him. So they send him out. And then Jesus said, now, now Jesus is going to answer, I, I think, verse, uh, verse 30 and stuff. But also, what's going on in 32? I don't know if he knew the guys were coming after him. But kind of get this. Here's what they're saying. When the Christ comes, will he do more signs than these? Then Jesus answered them. Now think about, if you're Jesus, number one, they just said, you can't be the Christ because we know where you're from. And we're not supposed to know where he's from. And Jesus kind of answered that. But then they accused him of something else. And notice how Jesus never defends himself. Have you, ever, have you ever paid attention? Like God doesn't have to defend himself. God's pretty secure in who he is. And he never like, you know, tries to fix things when people don't believe correctly. And Jesus now, here's what Jesus is doing. He's gonna take him a little bit further. Just like he takes you and I further. Have you ever noticed like, as you start to grow in the Lord, you realize how much you don't know and you wish you knew more. Like, I, you know, when, when I came out of Bible college, I thought I came out of Bible college to save the world. And I thought, how did this world get along without me? And I was gonna fix everything, and I thought I knew everything. 
I had some theological ideas. I had different things down. I thought I had it together. Now, after teaching the Bible now for almost 32 years, here's what I realized. I'm like in kindergarten, right? I'm just beginning. And so, listen, man, Jesus pushes us and pushes us. So, so here's what he said to them. Instead of defending, instead of trying to answer them and say, oh, here's what really is going on, listen to what he says. Then Jesus said to them, I shall be with you a little while longer and then go to him who sent me and you will seek me and not find me and where I am, you cannot come. Now that's some pretty intense stuff he's given them, right? Jesus just let him know what? He let him know that he's gonna die and raise again on the third day. Now, he said it a little bit cryptically, but that's what he's saying. Now once again, think about it. Jesus is speaking about spiritual truths to people who don't have spiritual glasses on or spiritual hearing aids or spiritual devices, right? All they can think is physical and worldly. So he just laid that out. He goes, hey, you guys, I'm only gonna be with you a little while and then I'm gonna go and you're gonna seek me and not find me and where I go, you cannot come. Now, another thing I think he's letting them know in this is he's t I think he's telling them, you guys need to stop sinning away the day of grace. I believe God gives us grace, but I believe if we keep pushing it away, we're eventually gonna push it where it's gone. And I believe he's telling us to say, you're not gonna find me. You're gonna eventually come and seek me and you're not gonna find me because you pushed me away, right? And then he says this, or I'm sorry, then the Jews, I love it. Here's their interpretation of what he just said. Check this out. Verse 35, then the Jews said among themselves, where does he intend to go that we shall not find him? Now, don't you love that? Here's what the Jews are saying. I don't know where he's going. Where is he going? I don't know where he's going. Where do you think he's going? I don't know where he's going. And then, listen, so they come up with this. Does he intend to go to the dis uh, dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? So here's what they're saying. Oh, he must be going out of town. And that's why we can't find him. Yeah, he really is going out of town. He's going off the planet, right? But listen, that, that's what happens, and you and I need to be people that we understand people can't process spiritual things without the Spirit, and we need to, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I get real uptight, and then I kind of blow it when I'm witnessing, especially when you get to a point like this and they say something stupid like that, and you want to say, you're just stupid, and you blow your witness, Right? Maybe you guys don't. You guys are probably much calmer and better witnesses. And, you know, and I just, yeah. and, and now we need to learn from Jesus, right? They just said this. Now, wouldn't you think Jesus would say, would you guys quit being so stupid? What on earth do you mean he's going to the dispersed? What, what would make you think I'm going to leave this area? But listen to what he says. He says, hey, and, and he says, what is, or I'm sorry, they said, what is this thing he said, you will seek me and not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. So they're like processing that, so here's what they're thinking. He's going out of town, we can't figure out what he's talking about. This guy's kind of lost his mind, I hope he finds it, but you know, this is what's going on. Now, listen, all of this is building and building, and I don't know, I don't know if we're building over several days, I don't know if we're building in one day, but it's building and building and building, and now we're gonna hit the crescendo, right? We're gonna hit the very top. So he tells us, John recording this says, on the last day, the great, or on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out. Now before we get to what he cried out to, I was sort of blown away that there's a lot of controversy on which is the last day in the great day of the feast. I'm thinking, you know what? Sometimes we just want to like nitpick things just because maybe it makes us sound smarter. I don't know. I would think the last great day of the feast would be the last great day. It would be the end of the feast, the last day that you're feasting, right? The feast lasts seven days. Oh, no, no, no. You see, on the eighth day, they did something else. And so there's this dilemma of, did Jesus stand up on the eighth day or the seventh day? I really don't care. Uh, you know, I mean, people can fight about it and argue about it. So on this, and, and here's, here's the big, big difference. 
On the seventh day, remember they're doing this feast and every day I said they would pour out water so the priests would go down to the pool of Siloam and they would take seven pitchers and then they would go up and they'd pour them out on the temple steps and they would flow down representing the water coming from the rock and they would do that every day. And then as they do that, they would sing the Hallel Psalm, Psalm 113 through Psalm 118, have this celebration and then at night they would light the candlesticks for the pillar of fire. So all of that's going on real festive. Well, on the seventh day, I was gonna say on the last day, but I think it's not, I, well, it's not the last, last day. So on the seventh day, they would do that seven times. So on the last day, they would have seven times the amount of water, and Jesus is about to stand up and say something about water. I, for one, think that's probably the atmosphere that was going on, but then others say, no, it wasn't the last day, it was the last, last day, which is on the eighth day, and on the eighth day, they wouldn't bring any water because that would represent the day when they would tear down their booths and they would all enter into the land representing that, and when it went entered into the land, they just had to trust God for water so the water wasn't being poured out, and then Jesus would say this, okay, so you know what, you can figure out if it's the seventh day or eighth day, I don't care. I don't think it, listen, I don't think it changes that much. Obviously, it changes the situation, but Jesus is still saying the same thing. So, all of that just to confuse you. I just wanna see if you're paying attention. There is a test before you leave tonight. So is it the last day or the last, last day? So, on the last day, not the last, last day, but the last day, the, day of the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out. Now, here's something else interesting before we get into this. Jesus has been teaching in the temple. I think this all took place on one day, but I could be wrong. He's cried out one time and let them know, you think you know where I'm from, but you're mistaken, and you don't even know me. And then they've had this, Now this time, what does he do? He stands up. When rabbis taught, unlike pastors at churches, the rabbi sat and taught and everybody stood and listened. I think we should practice that sometimes. (laughs) And you wouldn't fall asleep. But hey, so he would sit and teach. So he's been sitting and teaching. And now what does it say? He stood. If a rabbi stood up, here's what that meant. You better really pay attention to what I'm telling you now. This is extremely important. So Jesus stood, right? This is, this is intense, I think. He stood and cried out. So again, he shouted very loudly saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of, it, out of his heart, Will flow, uh, will flow rivers of living water. And then John kind of gives us his commentary and tells us, by this he spoke concerning the Spirit whom, the, whom those believing in him would receive for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So Jesus is giving us something that we need to understand and he makes this receiving of this Spirit this being filled with water that's gonna flow out of us, he's not talking about literal water. What's he talking about? You and I get the responsibility when we're filled with the Spirit to give the gospel to others, right? We're supposed to be sharing and multiplying and doing these things. But when Jesus says this, I want us to notice three conditions he puts on this because I think it's important. Number one, first, you have to be thirsty. Not thirsty, thirsty, but thirsty. You have to be thirsty for God. You need to desire God and have that that want in your heart to know him and to be near him. Number two, after you're thirsty, you gotta come. Listen, this is not talking about just giving mental assent to certain facts about Jesus Christ. Lots of people do that. This is talking about coming in close contact and an intimate relationship with him. You have to be thirsty, you have to desire that. Then you have to come and you have to get close to him. Oh, and then guess what? You could do some drinking. You gotta take him in. Are you kind of getting what he's letting us know? You can't stay distant and know Jesus. 
You can't keep him at an arm's length and have a relationship with him. It's not gonna work. And many people try. And many people fake it. And here's what Jesus says. When you come and you're thirsty, now here's what I love. Man, when you come and you're thirsty, he says, he who believes in me, again, not mental assent, but someone who's thirsty, someone who comes and someone who drinks, believes in me. He says, the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow living water. Now, some of the brainiacs want to say, what scripture is he quoting? Well, he's not quoting. He didn't say, I'm quoting, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Some people say he's, you know, making a, a, a thing to Proverbs. You know, there's Proverbs chapter 11, Ezekiel chapter 47, Zechariah 13. Uh, you know, there's a lot of places where the word and the relationship and the spirit refer to as water. I think two specific ones, you can read these later, Isaiah chapter 12 and Isaiah chapter 58. So listen, man, he's pointing us in a direction and he's saying, God's word says when you come to Jesus and you're filled with the spirit, something's gonna flow out of you. And then John lets us know, again, he wasn't talking about water, right? He talked about receiving the spirit because the spirit had not yet come. Now, obviously the spirit was in the world. He is in the world, right? It's not like, and, and we'll maybe get into the rapture here in a minute, but listen, the Spirit's in the world, and when you become a believer, you get the Spirit, and you get all of the Spirit. You don't get part of the Spirit. You don't get a little bit of the Spirit. But there's also a work of the Spirit that needs to happen in your life. It can happen at conversion. It can happen after conversion, but it needs to happen, and we need to understand there's this, what some people call the filling of the Spirit. Some people call it the baptism of the Spirit. Some people call it, you know, something else. And I don't care what you call it, just get it. Right, it doesn't matter what you want, label you want to put on. We need to know, and listen, I think it's very simple. If you don't know if you have it, then you know what? Spend some time, ask God to fill you, baptize you with, have the Spirit come upon you, whatever term you want to use, and ask him to do that. Here's what I know, he's gonna do it because you receive that by grace, just like salvation by grace. You don't have to earn it. I remember when I was a new believer, I think I told some of you, I used to listen to a guy, I'll even give you his name, Leonard Ravenhill, and some of you may really love Leonard Ravenhill, I may kill it for you right now. And I remember listening to Leonard Ravenhill, and I remember him saying, you will never get the Holy Spirit until you're holy, because he's the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will never come in you till you're holy. And here's what I thought, I'm sunk. I mean, I got really discouraged. I thought, well, I, it's, uh, I sh- did you sin today? Don't raise your hands. <laughs> right? I mean, I'm thinking that whole thing, and I'm thinking, well, that's never going to happen to me. That is not a correct teaching. You cannot earn, quote, the Holy Spirit from God. He gives, right? Luke tells us, listen, if your son asks for a, an egg, are you going to give him a rock? If he asks for bread, are you going to give him a snake? No. How much more will my father give you the Holy Spirit if you ask? And so, listen, I don't think there needs to be this big thing, but I do think we need to understand and we need to know, hey, he's not just talking about the salvation part of receiving the Spirit. He's talking about that work the Spirit does to make the living water flow out of us and make us people who were were bolder in our witness and we love more and we have a whole different view. So that's what he's talking about here. So Jesus challenges them. And then verse 40 says, therefore, many from the crowd when they heard this saying said, truly, this is a problem. Now they're going, listen, now they went from can't be to oh, this must be. It's like, mm. These guys are nuts, right? When they're talking about the prophet, again, they're talking about Deuteronomy uh, 18, and, and this must be the prophet. So, so listen, it says, truly this must be the prophet. And then others said, this is the Messiah. But some said, will the Christ come out of Galilee? Oh, now we're down to, now they do know where he's from, right? They're thinking he's from Galilee. That's not where he's from. 
He's born in Bethlehem. But, oh, but listen what they say. They say when the Christ comes, right, didn't we read in verse, in verse 27, no one knows where the Christ is gonna come from? Now check this out in verse 42. Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem where David was? What? Didn't you just say, I wanna call him out, right? Didn't you just say in verse 27 that no one knows where the Christ is from? Now in verse 42, you're telling me he's from Bethlehem? You guys make up your minds. And that's what happens when people don't know him and don't know the word, right? So then they go from Bethlehem where David was. Now check this out. So there was a division among the people because of him. Now some said they wanted to take him, but no one laid their hands on him. Oh, isn't it interesting? Jesus caused division. Shock, shock. Doesn't he do the same thing today? He'll always cause division. He told us in Matthew chapter 10, Luke, or Mark chapter 3, Luke chapter 12, right? I've, not, I've come to cause division. A mother against a, a, a daughter, a father against a son, and, and he goes down the whole thing, right? It causes division. He will always cause division from believers and unbelievers, and we need to not try and get together with unbelievers and lock arms and sing kumbaya. We need to be people who say, listen, you don't believe what I believe, and I believe you're wrong. It's okay to say that. You don't have to say you're wrong. I believe you're wrong. And you don't have to fight about it. So, listen, man, so now here's the thing. Now they're divided. Now they're like, me, 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 right? And they're bickering. And then it tells us in verse 45, it says, then the officers came to the chief priests. Remember the guys they sent out back in verse 32? Remember in verse 32, they sent the guys to arrest him? So those are the guys. They came to the chief priests and the Pharisees who said to them, why have you not brought him? So here's the thing. They show up empty-handed. What did they tell him to do? Go get Jesus. Go arrest him. I kind of like this. Go arrest Jesus. Now we're going to find out Jesus arrested them, right? They go, they go, and here's what they told him. The officers answered in verse 46, no man ever spoke like this man. Wow. Wow. So you got these guys who are supposed to arrest him going, no. Not a good idea. Oh, and then the Pharisees answered them and said, are you guys also deceived? Now, listen to, listen to their criteria because they think this is important. Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Oh, now, listen, here's what they said. We don't believe, so you can't believe. Hmm, wow, be careful, be careful when religious, and that's what religious people do, right? They didn't say check the word. They didn't say validate it with this. We, none of us believe, so you know what? Why would you believe those losers out on the street, those people who don't know anything? Oh, let me read what one rabbi said. This is an interesting thing. He said this, if anyone has learned the scripture and the Mishnah, but has not served as a student of the learned one, he is one of the people of the land. And if he has learned the scripture, but not the Mishnah, he is an uneducated man. And if he has learned neither the scripture nor the Mishnah, the scripture says of him, I sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of men and with the seed of cattle. He is indistinguishing indistinguishable from an animal. That's what they thought of people who weren't on their level. That's sick. Yet there are some people in ministry who think that. Have you ever had anybody in ministry tell you, you can't understand it, listen to me? Oh, when they tell you that, you need to take off. You need to get out of there. God wrote the Bible in plain language and plain people can understand it. And so these guys lay it on them. 
hey, none of us believe. Now, I love this scene. This has got to be the scene of all scenes, right? So here's what they say. None of the Pharisees believe in him. What are you guys doing? You guys are stupid. That's what they just said, right? Don't be deceived. Don't be accursed like the people of the land. Oh, check this out. Verse 50. Nicodemus. Oh, remember Nicodemus? Nick at night, right? In chapter 3. Nicodemus. Check this out. Nicodemus, he who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, being, what does that mean? Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was part of the Sanhedrin, right? Nicodemus, listen to what he says. Here's what he said to them. Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he's doing? Hey, he just called him out, didn't he? What are you guys doing? You guys already judged him, condemned him? We don't do that. We hear him. And we do things correctly, right? So Nick stands up after, he, after they called all the people stupid. And here's what I think Nick is saying. You said none of the Pharisees believe? I believe, right? Right? You got to love the guy. Now, he's not real bold yet. He's bold at the end of the book. But he's not real. He's kind of coming out, right? Some people, hey, some people, it takes them a while, right? For some people, coming to Jesus is a journey, and it takes them a while. Some, some get radically saved. Some go on a journey. Nick's on his journey. And he kind of pushes back on them. So here's what they said to Nick. Verse 52, they answered him and said, Are you also from Galilee? Search, for no prophet has risen out of Galilee. Seriously, dudes, here's what, if I was Nick, here's what I would say. You need to search. There is a prophet who came from Galilee, at least one. His name's Jonah. Check out his heritage, check out where he came from. Now others say maybe Amos came from Galilee and maybe Hosea, but we know, we know Jonah did. And so right there, isn't it interesting they just blurt something out and think he's not gonna know. Now I don't know if Nick challenged him or not. And then verse 53 says, and everyone went to his own house. Then verse one of chapter eight says, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives and we'll talk about that. You guys thought I was gonna teach all of chapter eight, didn't you? So, what did we learn? One thing I think we need to be so careful of is we need to distinguish between tradition and truth. I think that's important in our relationship. I don't think it's going to send you to hell, but I think it's important that you know why you believe what you believe, especially as we witness to other people. And then, my prayer is we've learned how to deal with some kind of, you know, people who get a little hostile ta- towards us. Let's not, let's not be people who always want to fight back. And, and that's kind of, you know, I, I'm Serbian. And we're kind of built that way. And it's hard, man. It's hard. I have to, I have to push that down because, uh, man, when somebody does something, I just want to, okay, I'm going to take you out. You know, we're going to settle it. So, listen, understand People in the world are not thinking the way you think. And check this out. It's okay. You need to change your thinking. You need to work with them. You need to be able to pour into them and give them the truth. That's what we're here for. We're here to shine light, not to pick fights. And look what Jesus does. He never argues with them. Well, you guys, he says, hey, you know what? Think about this. Think about this. Think about this. And that's what we need, just plant those seeds, just get people to think about things. So let's learn from him, and let's be more like Jesus, right, in our world, and let's be people who we exalt the name of Jesus when we're out there. It's Christmas time. You can talk about Jesus with everybody right now, because it's open season, right? So let's go hunting, and let's go after people, and get as many saved as you can during this time. Let's stand up and pray. Father, I do thank you. I thank you, Lord, for your word and, and Lord, how good it is just to be able to watch and be able to to see as you interact with others and you interact in that crowd. God, I pray, I pray that we would glean from this and that we would be people who would have a greater understanding of you and who you are, and who we are, and even who the world is. Jesus, use us. Let us be light for you. You said, 
rivers of living water would flow out of us. I pray that we would yield to the Holy Spirit and allow him to work in the hearts and the lives of the people we come in contact with. And I'm gonna ask you to stay in an attitude of prayer uh, just for a couple more moments. And if you are here tonight, and hey, maybe somebody invited you and you came and, and you're a little bit uncomfortable, but at the same time, maybe you're convicted and you're feeling that, that whole uh, uh, nervousness and a little bit of anxiousness that is somebody going to make you do something? No one here is going to make you do anything. But we do right now want to offer you the gift of salvation. You came here, you're here, and you do not have a relationship with Jesus. You've never asked him to forgive your sins. You've never admitted to him that you know you're a sinner. And now is the time to change all that. Right now is the time to be honest and open. And it all starts with you recognizing and realizing you are a sinner. I don't, I don't think that's hard. I think all of us know that. It's just kind of hard to, to kind of verbalize it. Yes, I am a sinner. But we know we've sinned. We know we've done wrong. And I don't have to explain what every sin is. We know. So you know you're a sinner. But what a lot of us don't know is that by sinning, we didn't just do wrong. We offended a holy and righteous God. And now what we earned, what we deserve, is his eternal wrath. That's bad news. That's horrible news. The good news is Jesus Christ, when he came and paid for our sins, he took the wrath that you deserve, the wrath that I deserve, he took it upon himself, and he paid that price in a moment, in an instant of time, because he loves us. And now, just as he challenged these people to believe him, now he's challenging you tonight. Believe me, trust me, I took your sin. I took what you deserved and I paid for it. Now trust me that I did that and you can have eternal life instead of eternal wrath. So all you have to do is break down and be honest with him. And it starts with you letting him know you're a sinner and then you're asking him to forgive you. So I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. And you can say this prayer with me out loud or silently. If you're home, watching from home, you can say the prayer right where you're at. You don't have to be in this building. Hey, if you're backslidden, man, come home. Come back to Jesus. I know that's his heart and his desire for you to come back. Stop being miserable and come home where you belong. So say this prayer. Jesus Tonight I confess to you that I am a sinner. I'm sorry that I sinned against you. And right now I'm asking you to forgive me. Jesus, thank you for dying for my sin. Thank you tonight for your forgiveness. And now I want you to come into my heart and change me. Jesus, come into my life and guide me. Tonight, I'm asking you to be my Lord and my Savior.